Welcome to the last lecture um, of the first part of the course on uh, fundamentals of machine learning over networks. In this course, we're going to talk about uh, deep neural networks. So essentially, as you will see later in the course, um, it's, it's like a recap to whatever you have seen so far. So uh, let's delve into that. Um, Okay, uh, so first we're going to start with um, a recap of the optimization methods and it's going to be a little bit extensive recap in the sense that we're going to start from convex optimization setting to stochastic setting, non-convex setting and everything over the network. So whatever that you have seen and then you will see that training of deep neural network is essentially an application of whatever we have said. Um, then we will see the hardness of deep neural network optimization landscape um, and essentially we, we're going to cover um, some of the techniques that are used in the existing library. So whenever you're calling some solver to run your deep neural network, what is actually inside that and what is the main reason behind having those, those kind of solvers? Uh, or different functionalities of that solver. Um, and then finally, um, example of um, how to apply your optimization knowledge on, on training deep neural networks. Okay, uh, cool. So let's just start. Um, start from a smooth convex setting. Um, so the famous problem that we are interested in is a finite sum. Uh, so one over n summation of f of i. Uh, for the case of neural network, for example, w could represent all the parameters of a neural network, including the weights and biases you will see formally later on in this uh, lecture. But uh, f of i, this index i, could perhaps represent a uh, loss for just one specific sample and n could be uh, the whole data set. So you have done some homeworks on, on these kind of functions. Uh, the generic solver that we can have um, is taking, well, iterative solution is like WK plus one is the previous solution that you have or previous parameter plus some, some update and this alpha kg is some update and g is um, somehow kind, uh, it's called descent direction doesn't have to be necessarily descent direction but then g of wk essentially says in which direction you should go and alpha k says how how large that step size should be toward that direction um, so we have seen the impact of preconditioning so essentially Gradient descent, for example, is one example of this situation where G is minus of the gradient. And in that case, you're ensured to go downhill at every iteration. Um, so the optimization landscape, if it is something like, if it is like uh, this guy versus this guy, uh, then we have seen that if you run uh, gradient descent on this landscape, then that's pretty nice. But then the problem is that if the number of parameters are too much um, for essentially a large scale optimization problem, usually the landscape is something like that, where in some coordinates, it's really scoop. So in that case, you're going to need a precondition, these iterations, essentially first shape this landscape and then run gradient descent on that preconditioned landscape. So this is the whole idea. Um, and then you can see that gradient descent is essentially like preconditioning on a norm defined by Euclidean norm. So essentially there is no benefit, there is no difference between dimension one and dimension two. You're going to treat all the dimensions at the same time and then take the gradient steps. Uh, but then you can define other norms as you have seen in lecture two and then you can recover kind of a Newton method where you're going to precondition with the Hessian matrix locally around that uh, that that. Uh, current point. Uh, so you're going to precondition and then multiply that by minus of the gradient. So essentially, again, you're going to take the gradient, but then in, in a new landscape, uh, which is, by the way, much, much nicer in the sense that L divided by mu, if uh, L was the smoothness parameter and mu was the uh, strong convexity parameter, is now much better in that case. Um, so what does it mean? It means that after a few iterations, perhaps you can converge in this uh, regime. The problem is just finding the grade, uh, finding the Hessian and then taking the inverse of that, which may not be that much feasible, especially if either 
the uh, if essentially if wk the size of the parameter is just too much in that case it's going to be very very hard to find this um, then we have seen the uh, another kind of problems which is over parameterization so uh, we have seen over parameterization and what it says it says that well it's, it's a good thing over parameterization essentially means that um, let's say you you have three samples, but then you want to approximate those three samples or a few samples with a, pin a, a, a polynomial of degree, I don't know, 10, for example. So uh, then you're over parameterizing the network uh, or the, 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 the uh, approximator. The good thing in that case is that you're going to improve the expressiveness of your model. But then what's the bad thing? The bad thing is that you're going to overfit to that specific samples. Uh, so you are not actually learning, you are just overfitting. So in that case, we have seen that uh, we can add regularization term to promote sparsity. We can go with the smaller norms and then many, many different regularization terms to, to achieve different goals, perhaps. Um, here in neural network, we will see some completely different tricks to handle this over parameterization. Um, and then we have seen, uh, again, the setup is a smooth and convex functions. Uh, we have seen big data sets. Uh, in that case, uh, computing this gradient, so still we're gonna go with the generic solver, but then how to find that G uh, gonna be challenging if you need, to, uh, you need to evaluate these gradients over millions or billions of samples, then in that case, we're gonna go with a stochastic gradient descent or in general, mini batch gradient descent where you're gonna take a mini batch of size NK, for example, at iteration K, and then approximate that gradient with this uh, Monte Carlo approximation of the gradients. So you're gonna replace that. Uh, okay. Uh, we're going to need all of these things in deep neural network anyway. Um, then uh, we have seen later, in lecture four, um, how to handle non-smooth or non-convex functions. So first, let's focus on non-smooth functions. Uh, we can go with the generalizations of the gradients. Well, the thing is that the gradients may not be defined, so we're going to generalize that just to, to be able to define the gradient and therefore define the descent direction. So we can go with subgradient definitions or proximal method, both of them would work usually. Um, the other approach, completely different one, is like you can smooth the function locally around those, those uh, singularity points and then optimize that smooth function. Uh, or you can go, for example, one example is like ReLU function. Oh. Let's say that you want to optimize over a function like that, y equal to this guy. So you may not be able to run anything here. So what you can do is that you can locally approximate this guy with, uh, with a quadratic function. So the function would be almost the same. Uh, but then you have this guy if x is larger than some threshold, t, and then otherwise it's like x2. Um, for very small t, the shape of the function would be almost the same, but then optimizing this guy would be much easier than the first one. Okay. Uh, and then uh, another, again, completely different approach is a successive smoothing, uh, a smooth upper bound minimization. So instead of optimizing the actual function, you're going to minimize an upper bound, but then since it's, it's an upper bound, then you have a degree of freedom to choose your own upper bound. And then the main problem in that case was the function not as smooth, so def definitely you're gonna go with some smooth upper bound. Uh, and then I trace over that. Um, so so that these are essentially main approaches to handle and smoothity along with some other options that you might have. So with the non-convex, uh, it's a little bit different. Uh, we have seen that we're gonna, we're gonna lose the global optimality. Uh, well, there is an NP-hard problem to find that, um, usually. Uh, we have seen the convergence to stationary point, and that stationary point, unfortunately, may be a saddle point. Uh, then uh, we have seen uh, how to escape those saddle points using first order and second order information, for example. With first order, we're going to need perturbation to the gradient descent or use a stochastic gradient descent. With second order, we have seen that we can go downhill using negative eigenvalues uh, or eigenvectors corresponding to the negative eigenvalues. But then since we want to choose that, then we can choose uh, the one with the strongest negative eigenvalue. Uh, 
um, just to give a little bit higher moment um, to that. Uh, and then we have seen some other solvers like gradient descent, which can converge to stationary points, successive convex approximation, coordinate descent, and block successive upper bound minimization. So all of them can be applied. You have degree of freedom to apply. So what we will see is that neural network can be somehow seen as a combination of coordinate descent and gradient descent, actually stochastic gradient descent. Um, and then one, one final thing is about smoothing. So that actually comes back to the non-smooth function. Well, not necessarily non-smooth. So uh, just imagine that this is the optimization landscape, so the orange one. Um, but then you can imagine that here we do have a lot of local optima. So this is a highly non-convex function. And by the way, this is just one dimensional function. So very easy. If you are given a function like that, then the easiest way to find the solution is just plot that anyway. Uh, but in general, uh, in high dimension, if the function behaves something like that, then you can smoothen this function. So how you would do that, so this is one version of smoothing this function. If you smooth too much, then you're going to lose the local geometry. So for example, here, this local minima here is, is a very good one. Another local minima is a very good one. But then here, you're going to lose all of them. Um, of course, you can, you can go with uh, a little bit better smoothing function. You may lose the convexity. So here is perhaps convex. Well, it's not actually convex here due to this. But then just imagine that this is like that. Then it's going to be convex, uh, concave. Um, so here you will lose convexity, but it's still optimizing over this black one is much, much easier and better than optimizing over this one. Just imagine that if you run gradient descent or perturbed gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent, whatever, it's going to take a lot of time to find this local minima. And then due to that perturbation, what you hope for is that that perturbation make this point jump to somewhere here. And then you can continue finding another one and then some another heuristic kind of algorithm that jump again and again and again until you find some, some solution that you are happy with. But what's the problem? The problem is that whenever you get closer and closer to the optimal solution, then these iterations here uh, will be multi your, your progress, alpha kg, will be multiplied by that g, which is a function of the gradient. So uh, around these local points, the gradient vanishes. So then the update's going to be smaller and smaller and smaller until convergence. But then afterward, you're going to give a momentum to be out of that convergence to, to hope that you, you can find some other solutions. So you can imagine that in that case, the iteration, iterating over this landscape would be much, much worse in terms of the number of iterations to converge compared to this one, compared, compared to a good solution. OK. Uh, and then we have seen in lecture five to seven on um, how to do learning and inference. So, so far, convex and the non-convex, no, no network setup. I know what would happen in network setup. We have seen the importance of the communication graph if we do have a master worker strategy or if you have a full network strategy or architect. Uh, we have seen the importance of parallel computing. Um, for example, here we can use these workers to do parallel computing. This can be, can be doable either in primal domain or in dual domain, depending on your, your specific algorithm or what you are interested in. They do have a completely different uh, interpretations anyway in different applications. So the iterations of a primal and iterations of a dual, they do have different interpretations. Uh, and then we have seen due to privacy uh, or distributed data set still, we may need to use architectures like that. So it's not coming from the parallel optimization perspective. It's just coming from distributed data set perspective, where you have some locally private information here that you don't want to share, but then you are willing to share your gradient or whatever like that. Um, and then this is applicable in many settings like uh, differential privacy, where you, you're going to add some random noise to the gradients that you're going to report. And then still, you can converge. Uh, we have seen the impact of limited resources. Again, all of them will be somehow used in, in the later slides. So you, you have seen impact of limited resources and resources, especially in, in, in the set of, when you apply machine learning to some fields. Uh, um, then you will see these limited resources more and more and more. So for example, if these guys are like some edge devices, I don't know, some, some very small and cheap sensors, then you may not have that much of computational power. Or these guys, um, 
the numeric precision here could be just 8 bit, whereas you have trained your network or your algorithm or whatever with 32 bits accuracy. So you cannot even apply that directly here. So then you need some, some change here. Uh, or the limitation could be from communication, complete, uh, computation, or even storage, again, once you want to apply that. So we will see a big neural network called AlexNet. The, the size of that network is like 250 megabytes. Um, and then if you have tens of those networks, you may not be able to apply them in all those chip sensor nodes. So you're going to need to somehow compress that network. Okay, cool. So any questions so far? Okay, great. So then we can go to, uh, to the basics of neural networks. So uh, we can start with perceptron. Uh, back to 50, I guess, uh, which is essentially a linear mapping plus activation function. So perceptron is uh, W transpose X plus W zero. Um, well, then you can augment this X by adding just one and then saying that W transpose X in general. Um, so in that case, it's just a linear mapping in that form, a mapping of W zero to those X augmented with one. Uh, to the input augmented with one, and then a nonlinear function called activation function. Um, so in this case, we have just one weight per input, very simplified model, uh, but then that is the sense of, of what's happening in neural network anyway. So we have a one weight per input, and the output is this activation function sigma of W transpose X, as we have seen, and this X is X zero, which is equal to one, X one, X two, up to Xn. Um, and then in binary classification task, for example, one way to choose this sigma, well, the traditional way, as is clear from here, is like a thresholding. If the input is larger than zero, um, then go with output one. If the input is negative, then go with zero. And then we do have a very good binary classifier in this case. Uh, of course, you can change that to make it a bit more smoother uh, by using like sigmoid functions, tangent hyperbolics, or, or ReLU functions, or some functions like that. You can change the shape of this guy to make it a bit smoother, perhaps, something like that. Uh, but then what we will see extensively, actually, in some other slides is that do we really need this, this guy here, this nonlinearity here or not? Or what is actually the role of the nonlinearity? Here you can see that if we don't have the nonlinearity, we do have only linear mapping. We can do only linear mapping. So what would happen if the actual mapping between input and output is not linear? Then we're going to start with first order Taylor approximation, nothing more than that. Uh, but then thanks to this nonlinearity, we can do much more in this very simplified setup. So I can see the importance of this guy. Uh, another example if, is if you have a concatenation of these layers, just, just drop those nonlinearity, then you have a linear layer W1, another layer W2, another layer W3. So essentially you're gonna have W1, W3, W2, W1, okay? Then what you can do, you can just replace the whole thing with just one W, right? Uh, to say that whatever W, that product of W321 can do, that single W can do as well. Uh, actually, can do even much better. So in that case, again, you're going to limit yourself to just linear mappings. But then what would happen in, if the mapping actually is not linear? Then in that case, adding those sigmas, um, or any nonlinear function in the between will break this line of arguments of W321 equal to another W. Uh, so it's gonna break that line. Essentially, it can, with the same complexity in terms of the number of parameters, uh, you have much more, expressive, much more expressive power for the whole network. Uh, you can represent a lot, of, a lot more functions in that case. We will see that. Uh, but then we will see essentially, uh, it's not actually today, it's not that much clear if you really do need this nonlinearity today. Um, we will see that. Um, so let's look at deep neural network, which is, which is essentially a concatenation of several, several layers like that. Uh, so uh, for every layer, we have W1, B1, uh, and sigma one, which is the nonlinearity in layer one, and then everything here will gonna, will gonna lead to an output z one, uh, which will be an input to the next layer all the way to the last layer z j. So in that case, uh, compactly we can write down one layer here as z j equal to sigma j. Uh, Wj, Zj minus one, so the output of the previous layer will be served as an input to the next layer, multiplied by a linear mapping Wj will be 
magnified and rotated, so linear mapping, and then addition with bj. Um, and then everything will be mapped through this Z, sigma j. Uh, for sake of simplicity, usually people assume that this sigma j is um, element-wise operator. So the dimension of this sigma j is our dj by dj, and dj is the dimension of the input j uh, to that sigma. Actually, it's the dimension of the output. Um, so then you can see it's just element-wise operator in this case. Uh, so for ReLU function, for example, it's, um, it's like this. So the function is like before, for negative value, the, the value is zero, and for positive value, the value is actually, the output is equal to input. Um, and that's called ReLU function. Okay, uh, so, and then you can imagine that the, in this case, Z0 is the input and Zj is the final output to Y in that case. Uh, some example architect that can be covered by this form, um, feed forward neural networks, which essentially is saying that all the weights um, are just from input to the output. So there is no feedback in that network. Uh, so all the communications essentially are from the input to the output. Again, there's no feedback. In the convolutional neural network, those WJs here, they are convolutional matrices. Uh, so something like that. Uh, so essentially WJ, ZJ is a convolution of ZJ. So now you can imagine that if we don't have that nonlinearity, and if we just for sake of simplicity, just remove this BJ, then what would happen is that we're gonna have a cascade of convolutional layers, and then convolution of convolution is another convolution. So essentially, you are having a layers of convolutions of convolutions of convolutions in this case, just one convolution. So then you really need that sigma, that nonlinearity to break this line of arguments. Uh, to increase this expressiveness power. Uh, fully connected neural network essentially says that all the weights are there, so no zero in WJ. Um, recurrent neural network with allow for some loops in the network, so there, there are gonna be some feedback somewhere from, from some of those links output to some of those inputs. Um, and then deep linear network, which seems silly by the way, uh, but then there are some reasons for that. Uh, and it's just a linear function, so dropping B and dropping sigma nonlinearity. Uh, but then this, this is really silly, why? Because you can imagine that the solution that you can achieve here uh, would be somehow, the final solution would be lower bounded by if you just replace the whole thing here by just one W and optimize over that W. It's easy actually to show that. Uh, but then the whole point of having that is to go to somehow the minimal working example that preserves the non-convexity of the whole function. Because if you replace everything here by just one W, then in most cases you can, you can somehow end up with, with a convex function. Uh, you can optimize over that, but then it don't give the flavor of optimizing over deep neural network. So, but the good thing with this guy is that um, it's much simpler than if you have that B and that sigma. But at the same time, the solution that you can, that can work here, probably that solution with some minor modification can work on a real deep neural network where you do have those, la those layers as well. Um, so that's the whole idea of having this network, just to get some more insight and then be mathematically tractable. Well, more tractable. Um, okay, um, so some established results in the field. Um, so the first one perhaps, well, one of the most famous ones are this uh, universal approximation theorem which essentially says, that if you have just one hidden layer, so one input, one output, and then one hidden layer, then in that case, uh, if you don't have any limitation on the data that you're gonna inject, and if you don't have any limitation on the number of neurons uh, that you can have in that hidden layer, then you can approximate any continuous function. Uh, so what does it mean? It means that you want to find, the whole idea of this deep neural network is to find a regression, or it's to find a classification, but that classification essentially is just a shape in the continuous function domain space. So, uh, and then this deep neural network can find that, that shape, whatever it is, as long as it's in a continuous function domain with any ac arbitrary accuracy. Uh, so then, a simple conclusion, are we done? So we can just use neural network and then we are done. Um, any, any idea? Well, you know the answer here, but. So why is still deep neural network is interesting if we know that it can approximate 
anything, but then why we can we cannot be in, in some data sets, for example, we will see performance no more than 60 or 70 percent. You can really easily find some adversarial example that can fool the whole network. But isn't it contradicting with this argument that you can find anything with any arbitrary accuracy? Well, the answer is um, it's not actually contradicting with this because this is about achievability theory. It's, it's not a constructive algorithm to say how you can find that. It just says that uh, there exists at least one mapping, so one set, one parameters for those Ws and those Bs, for example. Uh, that can approximate anything, but it really don't tell. Uh, it really doesn't tell how you can find those Ws. And there are some um, really exciting, exist, um, very nice actually, and somehow disappointing algorithms uh, or results, more or less in the same time, 89, that says that training a very simple deep neural network is three layer neural network is MP complete. So just, just give up finding this, the optimal solution, essentially, that says. Uh, so th what's the size of this network is really ridiculous. So the size of the network is, uh, is something like this network. You're going to have two nodes here. Uh, W2 is something like that. And then you're going to have some inputs of some size. So this is the network that you have. These are the inputs. Um, these, this is the, the second layer, one hidden layer, and this is the output. Okay, uh, and then training this, so this is a dimension D, this is dimension two and dimension one, the mapping from D to one with just one hidden layer. <clears throat> and then training this network, you can prove that this is MP complete. So even that very simple algorithm, so don't think of, Uh, so the question is um, how general this result is uh, with respect to the architect of, of the network and with respect to the objective functions. So there are some, some very recent results actually from 2015 onward that says that if you add some restriction to the network, uh, then actually you can find the optimal solution very efficiently. So the, the optimization problem seems non-convex from the very beginning, but then for that very specific restrictive setup, then that setup could be either on the input size, on the input, um, let's say, space, the space of the inputs, they could be very limited um, or can satisfy some arguments, for example. Or you can make sure with some very proper, um, with, with proper initializations, which is of course out of the scope of that work perhaps, but then with proper initialization, you can find the optimal solution. So the problem is non-convex, but then you have seen that if you have something like one point convexity, so the problem is non-convex, but if you have one point convexity, you can actually recover the optimal solution, right? So uh, in that case, one of those papers, for example, shows that how you can properly initialize the, the weight to make sure that if the landscape is like that, to make sure that, let's put it like here, to make sure that you're going to start with somewhere here, and then you can run the stochastic gradient descent, and then you can find this point. But then in general, you cannot do that. So if you don't have those kind of assumptions on, or those kind of restrictions on the input uh, property or space of the input variables or the outputs or some specific structure on, on the architect of the network, then you cannot do that. Um, so these results says that in general, once you don't have those restrictions, you may not be able to find that. But then if you add those restrictions, you may be able to find. Uh, <clears throat> okay, uh, but then on top of that, so it says that training that is MP complete, uh, but then again, this result about the hardness of this training actually doesn't put any limitation on how... Um, in general, the hidden units should be, and the data should be, the, the, the space of the data um, should be uh, from. So essentially, um, here, if you, if you recall this again, it says that given enough hidden units, so there should be no restriction on that, and then there should be no restriction on the, on the input, your data set. But then if you have some limited data set, uh, essentially limited resources could be insufficient data, 
um, or a lack of computational power, perhaps, you may actually overfit or underfit. So the problem doesn't come from the achievability. The problem comes from your algorithm that can try to, that try to solve this optimization problem. Okay? So there is a solution, but then your algorithm cannot find that solution anyway. So this is, this is, the, this is the message here. Uh, but then shall we give up in this case? Because this says that no matter what you do, you cannot find perhaps. So this is again contradicting to that. Uh, but then before giving up, let's, let's have a closer look at the optimization landscape. This is actually usually what you should see uh, if you are able to somehow uh, visualize that. So you can see you have a very crazy landscape and it's not actually as simple as something like that. It's actually much harder. Where somewhere is really smooth, somewhere here is much worse in terms of its smoothness. You have a lot of local minima here. Here is much, much nicer behavior. And then at the very beginning, you don't know where you are, okay? Um, so for this case, uh, what we're gonna do uh, is we can define the objective function as being the average of the loss well, this one over n doesn't have to be here as long as n is fixed, so the size of the data set is fixed, we can just drop this guy. It's a constant anyway. Uh, plus some regularization term, and this alpha is like a convex combination of this. Well, for convex, it should be alpha this guy plus one minus alpha that guy. But then essentially, you can see it's like the importance of the regularization term, uh, which should be positive, by the way. Um, okay, so W is the set of all the parameters, so concatenation of all those W's here and all those B's here. Concatenate everything, call that vector W, and then optimize over this, okay? Um, this F is a regularized, perhaps non-convex loss function. These are regularized functions. Um, and again, non-convex, and, and this, this is not regularized actually. So this F is, individual loss perhaps for your sample i, and then this r is uh, the regularized function, uh, regularization function. Uh, but then we have seen, if you drop that guy, or even if you have this guy, we have seen how to address this optimization problem, no matter if you want to call it deep neural network or whatever you want to call it, okay? And no matter what is the landscape, you, you have seen that there are some solvers how to do this non-convex optimization, it could be smooth or non-smooth. If it's non-smooth, then you know how to address. If R is non-smooth, perhaps, you know that you can use proximal methods to address that, right? If it is non-convex, which is in this case, then you know that you can apply coordinate distance. So why not using those theories? Uh, so you know how to escape saddle point because you know that this objective function, this here has a lot of saddle points. And as you have seen in lecture five, I guess, or four, uh, the number of saddle points would be exponentially more as the dimension grows, would be exponentially more than the number of local minimas. Um, so then you cannot run gradient descent to hope to converge. You're gonna converge to stationary point, but that's gonna be saddle point with very high probability. Then in that case, you're gonna need, you know that you, if you add some perturbation, then you have a penalty of log D, uh, and then with that, where D is the dimension of the input, and with that penalty, you can, you can converge, okay? That, that's great. By the way, what is that penalty for a neural network with 60 million parameters? It's log of 60 million parameters. So still it could be a huge, huge um, loss or a huge penalty that you need to pay to be able to escape saddle points. But here you go. Um, this is what you can do. Uh, so gradient descent, stochastic, B, C, D, block coordinate descent, second order necessary points, and all those things, you have seen how to apply your, your knowledge here in this. Uh, okay, so I guess that we are done for this lecture essentially now uh, because we have covered almost everything. Uh, but let's, let's try to look some more practical aspects of training deep neural network and what, in addition to whatever you know already, uh, we can add uh, to that optimization landscape. So uh, first of all, um, the main objective, well, here we have this optimization problem. So whatever we will see from now on is about how to address this guy, okay? Okay, um, so the first thing that uh, you want to have whenever you're given an optimization problem is let's try to find the optimal solution, right? Uh, the second thing is uh, how to do parameter optimization. So given that we aim to find the optimal solution, how to do that? Um, <clears throat> Usually you're gonna need some form of gradient evaluation somehow. Um, you're gonna need that first order, well, 
in general, you don't really need to have that gradient information. There are some algorithms called, uh, well, many different algorithms, but some of them called zero order methods where you don't use gradient information at all. Or um, there are also some, some Bayesian models where you're gonna approximate the function with, an, with another function comes from some Bayesian model and then you, op you, you optimize over that. So essentially you don't need any gradient of your actual function. Um, but most of the algorithms that we covered here, they are based on some form of gradients, okay? Uh, then how we can do this gradient evaluation, um, how we can address the computation over big data sets, with what we do have usually now, uh, whenever we talk about deep neural networks, um, and then finally how to escape saddle points. So you know most of the answers here, I'm just, just going through them. So a first question is how to globally optimize parameter? Well, give it up, don't try to do that. Um, usually it's really hard to say, uh, that your solution is the globally optimal and at the end of the day if you say that my training performance is in top 99.99 who cares about that 0.1 percent anyway uh, the good thing with with neural network in general machine learning is that for most of loss functions you now the you know the lower bound for the performance so the whole idea is to minimize something right but then you know what is the minimum loss and minimum loss usually is zero uh, so if you are sufficiently close within your tolerable bound to zero, then that's okay. It just doesn't matter if that solution is globally optimal solution or not globally optimal solution, it just doesn't matter. Um, for parameter optimization, you can use gradient descent. So we know WK plus one in that case gonna be, well, that should be W. Would be WK minus your gradient, which gonna be like that. Uh, so for every sample, you're gonna find the gradient with respect to that sample and then take an average over that. But in that case, I assume that plus alpha R of W, that's not there, okay? I just removed that. Um, otherwise, you're gonna add the gradient of that guy as well. Um, then how to do the gradient evaluation, we will see in the next lecture. Um, and then there are two very, very nice uh, presentation. You can just use them, but then usually you can use back propagation, but then we will see why back propagation and not why forward mode for finding the gradients. You can always use that as well. Uh, we're gonna see why. Um, and then essentially why, what is backpropagation? Um, then the other thing is heavy, heavy computation. So this guy could be very heavy to find this sum. Then in that case, we can run a stochastic gradient descent. So just use Monte Carlo approximation of that, just subsample that anyway. Um, and then finally, how to skip saddle points. We know how to do that. If you use this, a bonus would be, a byproduct would be that you can escape saddle points. So that's very easy. So you really don't need to do anything for that. Uh, of course, if you're clever enough, you can do something um, to make it, um, to make the whole algorithm escape saddle point faster. That you can do. But then if you really don't care about <clears throat> how fast you can converge, the whole objective is just to, to somehow escape saddle points, then run scarcity great in this and you'll be good enough. Um, if you think that you're not good enough, just reduce this NK increase the variance of the noise, and then you will for sure uh, escape those saddle points. Uh, okay. Uh, and then finally, um, we can, here we have seen that we want to optimize, so let me come back. We want to optimize over this W, and W is a concatenation of all those weights. So you can use also coordinate descent to do one of those weights, just to focus on one of those weights, freeze everything else, and then update that. So that's that's very easy thing that you can do, and then you will actually do that in, in most neural network scenarios. So um, back propagation is actually a very 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 simple algorithm that use just chain rule um, over something called computational graph. But just to make, um, I guess that most of you know that anyway. But uh, let's go over that. So what we can do is let's try to use back propagation and actually, well, back propagation in general it, it has been. Um, actually invented many, many times with many, many different in different fields. Uh, in general, you can call it reverse mode differentiation as opposed to forward mode differentiation. And you will see what, what is the main reason behind those meanings. Uh, but in the forward mode differentiations, um, let, let's say what is a computational graph on this example. So the example is, uh, let's try to find well, first, build a computational graph over this function, f is a plus b, b 
plus one and find forward mode differentiation and reverse mode differentiation on that with respect to A and B perhaps, okay? So this is a computational graph. You will start from A and B. These are the parameters that you do have. This A could represent W of first layer in neural network, for example, but the objective and then the whole, the whole function, the shape of the function is different. That is the role of example two to see how you can apply everything in neural network, but nothing fundamentally is different. So you start from A and B, uh, then in that computational graph, so the way that actually you code everything, is that you, you're going to have another node for every operator, so you have another node that computes the summation of A and B, so actually the first term here, and then you have another node representing the second term, call it D, which is B plus one, and then finally you have another node computing the whole, the whole product, which is C multiplied by D, okay? So I have done nothing magical. And then what I'm writing is that on every edge here, and this is the way that all this graph works, um, so for, you start from A and B, and then finally you will find F. So just one example, uh, what if a equal a equal to one, b equal to one? In that case, it's gonna be one, one. It's gonna be two, and then uh, this guy gonna be two, for example, and then this guy gonna be the product of these two, which gonna be four. Okay, very simple. <clears throat> uh, then. In, in those edges, I'm just writing the gradients. Uh, so the gradients of that node, okay? The target node with respect to the, to the uh, input node. So in that case, the gradient of C with respect to A, which is gonna be one, the gradient of C with respect to B. So it just doesn't matter uh, yeah, what is A and B. In that case, it's gonna be one, one, and one. Gradient of this node, which is D with respect to B, okay? I'm just removing these guys here for now. I'm gonna need this space. And then I'm doing the same thing here, the gradient of F with respect to C, which gonna be D, okay? And then the gradient of F with respect to this node, which is D, which gonna be C, okay? Uh, again, nothing magical in this case. Uh, what happens in forward mode uh, differentiation is we're gonna start, we're gonna go to the forward path. Forward path means that we start from parameter, okay? and then find the gradient. We go all the way to the output and then find the gradients all the way in the path, okay? So uh, let's try to find gradients of F in that case, but then we will see what's the problem. The gradient of F with respect to B, okay? So in that case, for all the nodes, I'm gonna write down the gradient of that node, well, uh, yeah, the gradient of F with respect to B, okay? So I'm just writing down the gradient of that node with respect to B, why? Because if you do that, then at the end, you're gonna compute gradient of F with respect to B. This is what you can do, right? Okay, so start from this guy, gradient of A with respect to B is zero, gradient of B with respect to B is one, right? Gradient of D with respect to B, what is that? Here you can just say one multiplied by one and that's actually a chain rule because this is a function of B uh, and then you now, this is a function of the previous node, whatever that node is, and you know the gradient of that node with respect to B. The only thing that you don't know, the gradient of this node with respect to that node, which is on the edge anyway. So you just multiply these two, which is gonna be one, here in this case, gradient of C with respect to A gonna be one multiplied by zero, which is gonna be zero. Uh, but then it's not zero because there are two nodes contributing to this guy. So the first one is this guy. And then the second path is through this guy. So the gradient of this guy with respect to B, with respect to this node, and then gradient of this node with respect to B. So one multiplied by one which is gonna be one at the end. And then the same thing here, so then you can say that the gradient is this multiplied by that plus this multiplied by that, and then you will do that for all the inputs. So it's gonna be D multiplied by one, C multiplied by one, okay? So now you can find, you, you, you have found these gradients. But what is the problem here? Well, not problem, what is the property here. So if you do that, if you go one pass of the whole network, one pass means that you start from somewhere 
and then go to the other end, okay? Let's call it one pass to the network. If you go one pass to the network, just imagine that there were some other functions G here, some other objective somewhere else, okay? With one pass to the network, you can find the gradients of all the outputs with respect to one particular parameter, okay? You start from B because you know, you should know from which input you should start. You start from B and then you go all the way to all the outputs and then that can happen with just one pass, one round of going to the network, okay? So what, you, what is the main characteristic here? In the forward mode, you can find the gradients of whatever the output is for all the outputs in one path with respect to one particular input, okay? Now, if you, if you have a neural network of 60 million parameters, how many times you need to go through the network? 60 million times, because you need to find the gradient with respect to individual parameters, not input. This is not X and Y, this is parameters W. So you're gonna need to do that 60 million times. But then what happens if the number of parameters is like 10 and the number of outputs is like 60 million. Then this, this is very efficient because by 10 times going through the network, you can find all those gradients, okay? But then what is the reverse mode? The reverse mode is, as you can imagine, it's just the reverse of this operator, operations. So you're gonna start from one output and then go all the way to the input. But then you can imagine that you're gonna pick one specific output so you cannot find the gradient with respect to all the outputs. Uh, which is okay with deep neural network because you would have only one output at the end of the day. Uh, and then the output is, in this case, is norm to loss, for example. So you would have just one output, but then you have 60 million inputs, well not inputs, 60 million parameters input to this computational graph. You have 60 million parameters, so with one pass, you start from one output, go all the way down to all the inputs. So with one run, you can find all the gradients with respect to 60 million parameters. So this is like a 60 million times gain compared to forward mode, computational gain compared to forward mode. Uh, but then the problem is that with one round, you can find the gradient with respect to only one output. But let's see how that works here. So I'm just deleting these guys. So what you would do at every node is like finding the gradient of f with respect to whatever the node is, okay? So here the gradient of f with respect to f itself is going to be 1. Here you're going to find the gradient of f with respect to this node, which is c. And then what it's going to be in that case, any idea? This is again the product of these two. The gradient of f with respect to this node, which is going to be d, is C, again, the product of these two. The gradient of F with respect to B, what that gonna be? So you have two different paths and you need to multiply over all, you need to sum over all paths. And for every path, you have the multiply, multiplication over all the paths. But then you really don't need to go beyond that node because whatever happens beyond that node is somehow encoded in that specific node anyway. So you, you're gonna have one D plus one C, which is gonna be C plus D. And then finally, the gradient of F with respect to A, what it's gonna be one D. Okay, so you have seen that I have gone just one path through the whole network and I have found the gradient with respect to all the inputs. But then what would happen if I have G again? Then I need to restart the whole process and go through that, okay? So this is essentially backward mode and forward mode, and the backward mode calls back propagation. So this is, this is why back propagation is very famous, because it allows a very, very huge gain in terms of computation, if you have a lot of parameters to train. Uh, a lot of parameters to find the gradient of, and that would help a lot.